Well, lots to be thankful for. I know it's been a crazy couple of years with COVID, and the winter has not been that fun so far, uh, but that just uh, kind of makes every, everything seem a little brighter, doesn't it? So uh, turn with me this morning in your Bibles uh, to the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 13. The Gospel according to Mark, chapter 13. Biblical prophecy has become a kind of a cottage industry within the United States. Uh, there are books and podcasts and websites and YouTube channels and conferences. Uh, these all abound. Uh, I can remember when I was a young boy, uh, The Late Great Planet Earth. How many of you remember that book? Even if you weren't in church, you probably remember it because it was a bestseller. I mean, it sold an incredible amount of copies. Hal Lindsey was the author. The book was published in 1970. And in it, Lindsay pointed to current events at that time, such as famines, earthquakes, uh, the power and, and influence of, at that time, the Soviet Union, which was a great world power, uh, and other cultural trends that were taking place, and, and looked at those as an indication that the return of Christ and the subsequent, subsequent end of the world was near. Then in the late 1980s, another popular book took the country by storm. A pastor by the name of Edgar Wisenant wrote and distributed a book entitled 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Occur in 1988. I think it's safe to say we know how that turned out. In fact, Wisenant's, it's interesting, his confidence was so high that he was quoted in an interview as saying, only if the Bible is in error am I wrong. I will say that to any preacher in town. During the summer of 1988, there were countless stories circulating about people who were so convinced of Wisenant's assertions that they sold off all their property in order to prepare for the end of the world. I can still, I was, I was 16, 17 years old, but I can still remember the fur that that book stirred up just locally. It seemed like every Christian I knew was talking about it. Do you think it's going to happen? Is it real? I mean, even people I thought were fairly solid Christians were really going at it. I mean, that was all people could talk about. It was like the entire focus of the church shifted to that book for a period of time. Of course, in more recent years, there's, there was Harold Camping, founder of one of the largest radio networks in the United States, Family Radio. He predicted that the rapture of the church would occur on May the 21st, 2011. And as that date drew closer and closer... Cable news picked it up. You probably saw, I remember seeing a truck in Rehoboth riding around with all these stuff on it, lettering about prepare, the end of the world is coming in you know, May 21st, 2011. And it was sad to read of all of the people who sold off everything that they had to prepare for that day. Just this past week, the phone rings at the church. I answer, Sussex County Bible Church, this is Dwayne speaking. Are you a pastor? Yes. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Do you think that this COVID virus is one of the plagues of Revelation? I was like, wow, nice to meet you. And that was where the conversation went. Questions about the end of days are on the minds of many. Especially as it seems now that it does, in fact, kind of seem the world's gone a little crazy. I mean, most of us have been locked down for nearly two years due to a virus that we'd never heard of before 2020. There's been a great deal of unrest in the streets of major cities around the world. NATO is on high alert as Russia has gathered troops along the Ukrainian border. And economic instability is everywhere. Inflation is high. Everything costs more. These questions are, of course, nothing new. People have been asking them for thousands of years. In fact, in our text this morning, we find these questions on the lips of Jesus' own disciples. Our text this morning is found in the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 13. This, this text features a, a lengthy teaching by Jesus. In fact, it's the longest of his teachings recorded in the Gospel of Mark. It's often referred to as the Olivet Discourse because 
Uh, it, was, it was named after the Mount of Olives where Jesus sat and delivered uh, this discourse. The discourse is far and away the most difficult of all the texts in Mark's gospel to interpret. In fact, it's probably up there in the top five of the most difficult texts in all of the Bible to interpret. Many commentators have spilled a lot of ink on this passage, trying to interpret it, diving down into the minutia, attempting to find and crack every prophetic code contained in in fact, there are entire books, many books, stacks and stacks of books, just written on these 37 verses, this discourse. We will not be doing that this morning. In fact, what we're going to do is we are going to look at this discourse as one message. I kind of had debated whether to do it in one message or two, and then the snow last week, I had it divided in two, and the snow last week, uh, God sovereignly, I guess, orchestrated that to squeeze the sermon into one. And don't worry, I'm pretty sure I can cover the 37 verses uh, in the time allotted. So we're going to look at this discourse just as Jesus delivered it, as one message, just as Mark records it. And I think this is important because if we get bogged down attempting to find and crack every prophetic code, I think we're going to miss the main point that Jesus is trying to get across. We're going to miss what he's telling his disciples and then also telling us as well. Sadly, I think that prophetic code cracking and news headline chasing, that mentality, I think, has actually served to undermine Jesus' intended purpose for this profound passage of Scripture. So I want you to follow along with me this morning as we read Mark chapter 13. We'll begin in verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed, this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginnings of of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, And you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated for, by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, here, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. But in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man, coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then He will send out the angels and gather His elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. 
From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near, at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the cock crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus speaks these words in his final week of ministry. He entered the city on a donkey. He has cleansed the temple. He has been debating with the religious leaders in the temple complex. Now here in Mark, in verses 1 and 2, he records this conversation. Mark records this conversation between Jesus and one of his disciples as he departs the temple complex for the final time. He will not return. He will be crucified and eventually resurrected and ascend into heaven. But notice what he says, verse 1. Look, teacher, this disciple says, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Now, that, that, that's not an exaggeration. The, the, the temple there in Jerusalem was a sight to behold. There, there was nothing like it in all of Jerusalem. There was nothing like it in the region, for that matter. And, and for these Galilean disciples, it was, like, it was kind of like a country boy going to New York City and standing at the foot of one World Trade Center or the Empire State Building or some of those places and just marveling at the sheer height of those buildings and, and how impressive they were. It would have been something along those lines. They, they would have been like tourists staring up, looking around in amazement at what they were seeing. And this disciple is overwhelmed by what he's seeing, the grandeur of it all. But notice Jesus' response. Jesus responds. He says, do you see these great buildings? He says, there will not be left here, one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Some of the stones that these disciples would have been looking at were solid 60-foot sections of carved stone that had been brought there and placed in the temple. Massive sections of stone. None of them are left today. None of them. They're gone. What Jesus said would happen has in fact happened. Not one of them is left upon another. Jesus is describing here the judgment of God. He's predicting it. It is yet to happen. The prediction of the judgment of God which would come upon the temple. The temple had become this edifice which had become the symbol of Israel's perversion of God's plan of salvation. The the, the Israelites, were, the Jews were not using the temple as it was to be used. It, It had become the center of religion. It had become an idol. It had become an idol to man made religion and thus it was going to be torn down. As Dr. James Edwards writes, he says, like a system of cells that has become malignant, the temple has forsaken its intended purpose and must be eradicated. And we know now from history that this in fact happened in AD 70 when the Romans came in and wiped Israel, uh, wiped Jerusalem, destroyed it and destroyed the temple. This was still future at the time these words were uttered. Of course, for the disciples, the shock and confusion that that this statement calls them is is seen in their response in verses 3 and 4. Notice, they go to the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, and it says, Mark says, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? Two questions that they ask him. In fact, you get a little clarification when, when you go back to this, the Olivet Discourse in the Gospel of Matthew. Here's how Matthew records that question that they ask. When will this happen? Right, Speaking of the destruction of the temple. And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Two questions. When's the temple going to be destroyed? And what are the signs of the end of the age? Now, when you and I hear that question of the disciples, we hear two separate questions concerning two separate events. But 
that we, we hear the destruction of the temple and we hear the surrounding events and the signs of the end of the age. To the disciples, however, those two things were synonymous. Those were synonymous events. Those were not two separate things in their minds. To them and to most Jews at the time, the destruction of the temple and the destruction of the city of Jerusalem was synonymous with the end of the world. They couldn't separate those two things. Just like if someone dropped a nuclear warhead on Washington, D.C., you would have a hard time separating that event from the end of the world. Most people would think that in the United States. The same was true of them. But in these verses that follow, Jesus provides his disciples with a window into future events, both near and distant for them. And he gives them and he gives us a, a very, some very clear instructions as to how they and how we should respond to the events as they unfold. Now, my way of interpretation as we consider Jesus' words here, it's helpful to remember that there's some dual, what we would call dual fulfillment taking place here. A dual fulfillment motif, we might say. Jesus, again, is speaking of two events here, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the end of all things. And while these are two distinct events, at Jesus, as Jesus speaks, he speaks of them in very similar ways, as you'll notice. And, and the best way of understanding this is that these two events are actually, in fact, linked together in that the events surrounding the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple typify the great tribulation that will precede the end of all things. John Wolverd writes this. He says, he writes of this dual language this way. He says, the conditions associated with the impending local crisis at Jerusalem's fall foreshadow those connected with the worldwide end time crisis. Thus, Jesus' words relevant to his disciples remain so for all disciples who face similar conditions throughout this age. Look with me at verse 5. Jesus speaks. And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginnings of the birth pains. So Jesus responds first with a warning. The warning, of course, presupposes that he will, he will not be there. He will be leaving them. And after he is gone, he says, there were going to be some who come and they, they, they will rise up and they will claim that they are the Messiah. They will claim that I am he, I am the one who was promised. And Jesus says, don't be led astray by them. They are, they are false Christs. You know who the Christ is. Don't be misled. Secondly, he reveals here that, that they will hear of wars and rumors of wars. He says, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes and famines. And of these events, Jesus says, look, don't be alarmed. These must take place. But the end is not yet. Th these are but the beginnings of birth pains. In other words, you will see all these things happening. You're going to see wars. You're going to hear about rumors of wars. Famines are going to happen. Earthquakes, all sorts of natural disasters. And you are going to be tempted to think that the end is upon you. But it's not. These things must take place. The end is not yet. Don't be alarmed by them. Don't be led astray by those who are alarmist, who are telling you that these things mean the end is upon you. These things will continue as they always have. They are the result of man's sin and of fallen creation, and they will continue to the end of time. And, and, and that, that Jesus here says that they must take place means that, that God is sovereign and in control, and, and He is leading history just as he ordained it. Think about that. Everything that happens on this earth is, is the result of God's sovereign plan. There is no raindrop that hits the ground that is not outside of his control. The ground does not shake apart from his control. These things must take place, he says. Jesus described these events as the beginning of birth pains. As Paul said in Romans 8, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. It's natural for us, right, to see 
these natural disasters. I mean, think about all of the natural disasters. When the Spanish pandemic, Spanish flu pandemic happened 100 plus years ago, everyone thought that was the end of the world. COVID comes, people start to think that's the end of the world. I remember back in 1991, I can still remember when the Gulf War was about to initiate. Remember that? And I can remember hearing sermons about going to the book of Revelation and going to this text and that text, predicting that this is it, it's coming, here we go, hold on tight. That's been happening for 2,000 years. World War I, World War II, all of those came with these predictions. These things, of course, wars and famines and pestilence and earthquakes will indeed characterize the end of time. But here's the difference. You won't have to ask, is this it, when it happens. That's what I told the gentleman on the phone. I said, the fact that you're asking this question tells me that it's probably not it. Because most of us are still around, according to the scriptures. Uh, a significant portion of the world's population will be destroyed by these plagues. Jesus continues with a prophecy here concerning what they, the disciples themselves, can expect. Notice, but be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils. You'll be beaten in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, he says, don't be anxious beforehand what you will say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. A brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father, his child, and children will rise against parent and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Be on your guard. That's the title of the sermon this morning. Be on guard. The phrase is repeated throughout this discourse, and it's central to the point that Jesus is making here. That is central to the Olivet Discourse. That's the whole point. I'm telling you these things so that you will be on your guard. What does it mean, be on your guard? He says, it's simply pay attention. Pay attention. Don't be caught off guard so as to be unprepared for what is coming. They're to be on guard because, he says here, they will be handed over to authorities and will be persecuted. They will be called to bear witness to their faith in Him in front of governors and kings and others. When faced with persecution, the twelve, and, and we could say all believers throughout history, may be tempted to think that the end has come. You might think that the end has come, but Jesus explains that this is not the case because first, the gospel must be preached to all the nations. It won't end with you, he says. The gospel must spread to all nations. And of course, we, if you go to the book of Acts, you see how this all transpired. There was great persecution in those days leading up to the, the, the destruction and the sacking of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. But you see in the book of Acts, the spreading of the gospel throughout the known world at the time. And of course, even those saints could not have imagined how far the gospel would eventually spread. Of this statement, the gospel must be preached to all nations. Professor Walter Wessel says this. He says, Jesus seems to be saying here, instead of looking for signs of the end, get busy and spread the good news. All nations must hear before the end comes. I love that. Instead of looking for signs of the end, get busy and preach the good news. Jesus continues here, provides them with some encouragement. He says, look, when, when they bring you up before kings and governors and councils and, and all of these things, you're, you're going to find yourself at times, no doubt, gripped by fear. You're going to be physically weakened and frail, perhaps from beatings and imprisonments and so on. You're going to be unsure of what to say. You may not be able to speak much at all. But he says, don't worry. In that moment, the Holy Spirit will speak through you. He will give you what you need to say and the power to say it. Trust Him. Again, we see that throughout the book of Acts. Time and time again, saints being put in prison, being beaten, being called to give an account before the, the authorities of the day. But this encouragement is followed by another sober warning about the, the depth of the, the betrayal that they will experience. Family members will betray one another, turning one another over to be put to death. What a horrific experience. He says, you're going to be hated by all, not some, 
by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end, he says, will be saved. The word save there refers to eternal salvation. You endure to the end, you will be saved. But, but we know from the Scriptures, it's not your ability to endure that saves you, but rather your endurance is the sign that Christ is persevering with you and that you are saved. So one way of looking at that is that, that endurance is not a prerequisite for salvation, but the evidence of it. As John, the Apostle John said, how do we know that someone is not a believer who was once among us? They left. That's how we know. The fact that they left is evidence of the fact that they were not one of us. And the same is true. If one does not endure, that's the surest sign and evidence that they were never a believer. So remember that the next time you see some cocky, arrogant deconstructionist on your social media feed. The one who perseveres in faith to the end of their life, that's what the endurance is about, to the end of their life. A life in this context that was likely cut short by persecution gives evidence of his faith. You see, friends, the one who has Christ alone as his treasure will endure all things for his sake. If Christ is your treasure, then leaving all of this behind will be of no ultimate sacrifice for you. If he is what you're living for, remember Paul says, for me to live as Christ and die as gain. You can only say for me to live as Christ if there's nothing else on this earth that you're living for. That's the only way that dying then could be gain. That's the attitude in the heart of endurance. While persecutions were certainly fierce during the early years of the church, they have continued, as we know, throughout the ages. Right now, in, in this world, you, you, Voice of the Martyrs and other, uh, other Christian ministries who are tracking uh, the global spread of the gospel report constantly intense and horrific persecutions that are taking place all around the world. These are continuing even to this day. In fact, remember the Apostle Peter reminded believers in his day, said, Beloved, do not be surprised when the fiery trial, at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. You should expect this, he says. <coughs> he says, rejoice and be glad in the midst of that trial. So Jesus tells his disciples that while all of these things will characterize the time period surrounding the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, they should not be mistaken as signs of the end of the age. In fact, they will continue to come, as we could say, in waves throughout the church age. Well, as we come to verse 14, there's a bit of a shift. Up until this point, Jesus has been speaking predominantly of the events the disciples would experience in their lifetime as God's judgment fell upon Israel and the temple and the holy city as it was destroyed. But in these verses, 14 and following, Jesus shifts his attention to those things that will occur at the end of the age. Don't look at those things, verses 1 through 13, and think that those are the signs of the end age. Those are not. These are the signs of the end Verse 14, but, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is in the house to, on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. The uh, phrase here, the abomination of desolation that we find referenced here is, is actually first mentioned by the prophet Daniel. If you go back to Daniel and read about the 70th week and his prophetic uh, words concerning the end of the age, we won't, won't go there this morning. Uh, that, that's where this phrase is first coined. And In Matthew's uh, gospel, Jesus speaks of this abomination of desolation as standing in the holy place. In the temple. The phrase is also used, it appears later, or, or, or before Mark's gospel would have been written, in that 400 year period of silence we call the intertestamental period. The apocryphal book of 1 Maccabees uses this same phrase to describe the des desecration of the temple that took place, if you remember, 
when the, uh, the Seleucid king uh, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, when he entered into the temple, you remember in that intertestamental period, put up a statue of Zeus, sacrificed a pig on the altar, which led to the Maccabean revolt. All of that was recorded in that intertestamental uh, ap- apocryphal work. The Jews, of course, saw this act of Antiochus as the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. And like the destruction of the temple that was promised by Jesus, just like that would foreshadow the judgment and calamity of the end times, so too that act of desecration by Antiochus foreshadowed another future desecration, another desecration that is still to come. One that takes place when the man of lawlessness, known in the Scriptures as the Antichrist, will also commit this great act of the abomination of desolation at the midpoint, as we would say, of the tribulation period. Notice that Mark adds this editorial comment. What I mean by editorial comment is that these were not words spoken by Jesus. Mark puts this in there. Notice, he says, let the reader understand. So he's, he's, he sticks this into the account, like, pay close attention here. Don't miss this. When you see this happen, you better pay attention, is what he's saying. This message, of course, is to the saints in the tribulation. He says, when you see this abomination of desolation occur, run. Run. That's the sign you need to be looking for. Run. There will be no time to pack a bag. There will be no time to grab a coat. Jesus says pregnant nursing mothers should pray that this does not happen during winter when travel is difficult. It is going to be very bad. It's going to get very bad and it's going to get very bad very quickly. Jesus describes it in verse 19. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. So whatever this is, it is unprecedented. Nothing like it has ever happened in the history of the world. Nothing like it is happening in the present. And after it occurs, there will be nothing like it again in the future. This is the greatest of all great tribulation that will ever occur on the earth. That's how we know this is not a reference to AD 70. There have been much more horrific things that have happened in greater tribulations than what took place in AD 70. So this is speaking clearly of the great tribulation of the end, unlike anything that man has ever seen. And if the Lord, he says, verse 20, had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, here he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to, to lead astray, if possible, the elect. There it is, again, the phrase, but be on guard. I have told you all these things beforehand, so there's no reason for you to be caught off guard. I've told you these are coming. This period of tribulation is unlike anything, he says, anything that has ever been since the beginning of the world or ever will be. It will be unbearable. Even for those who have trusted in Jesus, those tribulation saints, he says, were it not cut short, they themselves would be destroyed. Not only will the suffering be unbearable, but the power of deception by false Christ wielding supernatural demonic power will be overwhelming, possibly deceiving even the elect. These false Christs will be identifiable. They will will be performing signs and wonders like magic shows, like like, like some kind of, uh, of magicians, like an illusionist almost. Jesus, you remember, when he was asked for a sign, what did he say? I will not give this wicked and perverse generation a sign. These guys, these false Christs, you want a sign? Here's a sign. Here's a sign. Here's another one for you. They're going to be performing them everywhere, and everyone is going to be amazed. It's going to be such an overwhelming deception that even the elect, he says, would be deceived by it. The fall of Jerusalem, as bad as it will be, is but a shadow, a foreshadow of this great tribulation to come. Evil, unlike anything seen before, will be unleashed, we are told in the Scriptures. And the terror of God's judgment upon this evil will follow, and it will come like a flood. We wonder, why is God not doing something about the evil in the world? Why is He allowing this injustice? On that day, God's justice will roll down like a flood like a tsunami, and it will destroy evil and unrighteousness. And Jesus again says, be on guard. Because if you're unprepared, you will not endure. 
verse 24. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heaven will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then He will send out the angels and gather His elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. So following this great tribulation, the the universe, we are told here, will be turned literally and figuratively upside down. This this language here comes directly from the Old Testament, all of it. And it describes this cosmic upheaval that will happen when the entire world is overwhelmed with the coming of Christ. There was one commentator I read, and it was fascinating. He said, what happened when Jesus healed the leper? Remember what, when Jesus healed the leper? No one could touch a leper, right? Because they would be infected. But you remember Jesus, it was the opposite. When he touched the leper, the leper became clean. He was overwhelmed with cleanliness, we could say. And this commentator said, that's kind of a little tiny bitty taste of what will happen when the Lord returns. When he sets his foot on this earth, that's what will happen to this earth. Clean, it will be cleansed. All sin and evil and unrighteousness will be done away with. It will be destroyed. All things will be made new. Having brought full and final justice to this earth, the Son of Man will return. It says here, with great glory, great power and glory, He will return with His saints to gather His elect to Himself and and He will make all things right. What a, a glorious day that will be. Finally, in verse 28 and following, Jesus provides this note of hope. He calls his disciples here to learn the lesson of the fig tree. He says, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not pass away. Now let me pause for a second. This is a passage of Scripture that has been twisted and distorted in all sorts of ways over the years in in your lifetime. Some, one being Hal Lindsey and the late great planet Earth, took this passage of Scripture and said, interpreted it this way, the fig tree must represent Israel. Israel became a nation, not united nations, made Israel a nation in 1948. If that generation that sees that happen isn't to pass from the earth, That's 40 years. 40 years from 1948 is what? 1988. 88 reasons why the rapture will occur in 1988. You see where that kind of craziness gets you? Obviously now we're far removed from 1948. And there's been attempts to reinterpret this and twist it in other ways to make it fit. But the reality is that's a violation of what the scriptures clearly tell us not to do. But what Jesus is saying here, he says that just as you can tell that summer is coming by looking at the buds and the leaves on the trees, so too you will know when the season of his coming is near, when you see these things taking place. Now, there's again, this is a confusing passage. There's a lot of confusion here about what, when it comes to which event Jesus is referring to when he says, you know that he is near. It, it, it's, you know, some translations say you know that it is near. Some say you know that he is near. Both are acceptable translations, ultimately meaning the same thing. Speaking of his presence, meaning judgment, ultimately. Synonymous with judgment. Is it the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, or is it his final return? Which of these two? Well, I think it would be safe and, and probably best to read his words here again through that lens of dual fulfillment, right? So when the disciples see wars and unrest and persecutions increasing, they will know that the, the, the coming judgment of, of Jerusalem and the temple is near, and that's exactly what happened. There, there was a, a revolt that was taking place. It took place beginning in 66 uh, AD as the Jews revolted against Rome. Rome eventually began to fight and battle with the Jews, and eventually that led to the destruction and sacking of the temple in AD 70. Likewise, the saints at the end of the age, when they see the the signs described here, this abomination of desolation and the great tribulation, they will also know that his return is near, that judgment is near. The promise of Jesus here is that the generation that sees these signs in their day will not pass away from the earth. 
Heaven and earth will pass away, he says, but my words will not pass away. In other words, you can take this to the bank. It will happen. It will happen just as I have said it will. Finally, Jesus closes his discourse here. Verse 32, reminding his disciples and us of the purpose of this discourse. This is the summation. This is the purpose. This is what we're to be doing with this information. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake. Now, notice that verse 32. I want you to think about the implications of that for a minute. A man like Edgar Wisenant, who says that the Lord is coming back in 1988, specifically Rosh Hashanah, which was September of 1988, thinks somehow his er- he's missing the fact that he is displaying incredible arrogance. It says here that the Son of Man himself, Jesus in the flesh, does not know the, the hour of his coming, but Edgar Wisenant does. You see the danger here? Do you, that's, that's borderline blasphemous. Only the Father knows. Verse 33, be on guard. There's that statement away. again. Keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work. And commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come. In the evening or at midnight. Or when the rooster crows. Or in the morning. Lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all. Stay awake. So while we cannot ascertain. Or so we can ascertain the nearness of his coming. By the signs he has given. We cannot know for certain when it will be so. How long it will be. So we must be ready. What, what does ready mean? What does it mean to be ready? I think this, this is where a lot of confusion comes. What does it mean to be ready? He tells us it means to work. It means to work. Just as the master of the house goes away and leaves his servants in charge, he expects them to remain at their post and do their job. Not stand at the window trying to calculate when he's going to show up down the road. Stay at your post. Do your work. Why? Because the gospel must go to all the nations. James Edwards writes this. He says, The mark of faithfulness is watchfulness, not foretelling the future, but obedience in the present. Listen to that. The mark of faithfulness is watchfulness, not foretelling the future, but obedience in the present. When Christ returns... He will fulfill the many Old Testament prophecies about the end. But despite imminent signs, believers cannot calculate when, where, or how the end will come. When it comes, no one will miss it. Until it comes, no one should be misled. On his own authority, Jesus warned his disciples and the church not to be distracted or diverted from obedience to the suffering Son of Man, neither by by speculations nor by signs and wonders. We should most certainly, friends, study the prophecies concerning the end. But let me encourage you this morning to be on your guard. Don't be distracted by those attempting to read the tea leaves of current events. Don't spend so much time staring at the prophetic calendar that you forget your lost neighbor who lives next door to you. That is an exercise in missing the point. Edwards continues, it is important to note with glorious vision, this glorious vision of the future, what it does not affirm. He says, in, this, in the Olivet Discourse, there is no mention of a millennium, no rapture, no new Jerusalem, no rebuilt temple, and the restoration of Israel or the state of Israel, the battle of Armageddon, and no hints how and when Christ will return. About all these things, the text is silent. All these incidentals yield to the preeminent truth of the power and glory of Jesus, future coming, and the promise that his elect will be gathered to him. This preview of the future, this preview of the future should not lure us to calculate when Christ will return, nor to fear what will happen, but to know that he will return, to claim his own. He's coming, is his promise, and the gathering of believers to him is our hope. If you're a child of God, friend, let Don't don't let the certainty of His return lead you to fear. 
or lead you down the rabbit hole of doom and gloom predictions. No, let it encourage you and motivate you to the work of His kingdom. When I was a, when I was a young person reading books like The Late Great Planet Earth and watching prophecy teachers on TV, I heard little more than doom and gloom. In fact, in time, as I grew older, I came to anticipate with fear and trembling these events that were to come, rather than anticipate the joyful expectation of the Son who is to come. Again, that's an exercise in missing the point. I remember when I was young reading 1 Thessalonians 5, and this is when it struck me as a young man. I used to live in fear of these events, constant fear of these events, even though I was a Christian. And then I read these words by Paul to the Thessalonian believers. He says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. That was the light bulb. All this stuff that Jesus is saying is meant to encourage me. It's meant to build me up. It's meant to build each other up. It's meant to create joyful expectation and anticipation so that we will be motivated to be about the Master's business. That's what it's about. Friends, I'm going to tell you, be very wary of these shows on television where you've got guys sitting around debating the finer points of prophecy about, I just saw one the other day, about what Ukraine is about to do in Russia. While you're sitting on the TV watching these hour-long programs on TV, your neighbor's going to hell. We as a culture, have, evangelical culture over the years have been so distracted so many times and we've lost sight of what God has called us to do, what Jesus is calling His disciples to do. Be on guard. First of all, the, the gospel must be spread. The good news must be spread to all the nations. Don't be distracted by the signs and the wonders. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, there is application here for you this morning as well. The application is, is, is this, that His coming is certain. Absolutely certain. In fact, when Jesus spoke these words, He was roughly 33 A.D. And so just in just under 40 years, his prediction about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem would come true. We have the advantage of hindsight to look back, and we know full well that that historical event occurred. Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple is gone. Go there today. It's no longer there. You'll find a Muslim shrine, a mosque. The, the Dome of the Rock is sitting in the rough, roughly in the place the temple was located. It's never been there since. And just as that prediction came true, we can be assured that the prediction of the end will come true. God will not bear with us forever. Everyone in this room will either die and face the judgment, or you will see Him coming in the clouds and face the judgment. And there's only one way to escape that full and final judgment, and that is by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He came to this earth to save His people from their sins, we are told. He lived the perfect life. You and I have sinned against God. We deserve His judgment. We, we deserve every ounce of judgment that would fall upon us. The Bible is clear. We deserve it. But God is a God of grace, and in His grace, He has, has offered you a way to escape that judgment. He sent His Son Jesus who came to this earth, who lived a perfect life. He never sinned. He never rebelled against the commands of the Father. And the Bible says that He went to the cross and on the cross, all that judgment that was supposed to fall on me fell on Him. He paid for my sin, my rebellion. My judgment fell on Him. And the Bible says that, if I, that three days after that, he, after His death, He rose again victorious proving that the judgment, the judgment that stood over me had been dealt with. My sins had been paid for. And the Bible says that if I will come in faith and I will trust in what He did, not trust in myself, my religious practices, my good works, none of that, but I will trust in Him, the Bible says that God will take the goodness of Jesus 
and he will credit it to me. He will treat me as though I lived Jesus' perfect life. And he can do that because on the cross, he treated Jesus as though Jesus lived my sinful life. The Bible says my sins will be forgiven. And that life, that life from the resurrection, Jesus' resurrection life will be imparted to me and I will be given eternal life. His spirit will indwell me, give me the power and the strength to endure to the end. So that when this day comes, I have nothing to fear. Because I'm not destined for wrath. Jesus took my wrath on himself on that cross. And if you're here this morning and you have not done that, I encourage you to do it today. Because as Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. We don't know. We don't know. But one thing you can know is where you stand in relationship to the God, the Son of Man, the Son of God, who is going to return. And friends, that's the most important thing to know. Where do you stand before this holy and just God? Are you in right relationship with Him, or are you His enemy? Friends, that's the question everyone in this room needs to be asking this morning. That's the most important question that you can ask. And it's the most important question that you can ask of your neighbor, of your family members, and everyone you come into contact with. Jesus is the Lord of history. He is in control of all events. Whether we see them as good or whether we see them as bad. And we can be assured, friends, that because He is holding this universe in His hands, He will see all things through to completion. For the sinner, that means he will see your judgment through to its end. And for the saint, he will see your salvation through to its end. And for the saint, that is wonderful news. Wonderful news. Let's pray.